Good evening and welcome. Tonight we discuss an idea that has been long debated. The idea of social diversity in higher judiciary. Last week, the law minister told the parliament that nearly 80% of the high court judges appointed since 2018 belong to the general category. The representation of backward communities and minorities remains abysmal. Without a provision of a mandated reservation of judges in higher judiciary, how do we ensure adequate representation of those historically oppressed in the justice system? After all, inclusivity ensures more responsive institutions that champion the rights of all. And if you just take a look at the figures that the law ministers uh, talked about in Parliament, and we, if we can get that graphic up, I'll, I'll try and explain the breakup. So as per the law ministry, nearly 458 of the total number of judges, which is 604, those belong to the general category. In fact, it's a meagre number, 18 only, uh, which actually belong to the SC community. 9 belong to the ST community, 72 belong to the OBC community and 34 are from minority communities. So the percentage share of those belonging to the SC and ST communities uh, remains abysmal and that is something that's been a cause for concern in the past couple of years. Joining me, I have a very special panel tonight. John Dayal, a writer and human rights activist, uh, also with me. Ashutosh Srivastava, advocate of the Supreme Court. And Professor Ravi Kant Bahujan, uh, who is a Bahujan Vicharak and a Dalit Chintak. Thanks very much, uh, all. Uh, we'll be joined by the other guests in just a short while from now. But Ashutosh, beginning with you. You know, this is something that's been long debated, you know, diversity in higher judiciary. And these numbers that we can see on our screens, are not very encouraging. What do you think is the way right. forward? Because as I mentioned uh, earlier as well in my introduction, that there is no mandated reservation. How do we go about this? How do we ensure that there are adequate, you know, there is adequate representation from those communities which are historically oppressed? I uh, see. First of all, uh, you know, uh, the articles like uh, 124, 217, and 224 yeah. of the Constitution of India. They uh, speak about, you know, you know, the appointment of judges to the Supreme Court and the High Court. Yes. And in none of these articles, there are any provision for the uh, reservation of uh, any particular caste or uh, you know, any, any kind of people uh, to be included into reservation. So there is no any reservation uh, uh, system in our constitution for the appointment of judges either to the high court or to the, to the supreme court or likewise right now uh, when the law minister said that there should be inclusion of uh, you know the other category of uh, the people who are also competent to become uh, or to be appointed as the judges so that he doesn't say or speak about or promoting any reservation here first of all to make it clear he means to say that whoever is uh, competent hmm. to be appointed as the judges and belonging to a particular caste or uh, you know uh, uh, in uh, either in minority or maybe uh, to civil caste civil tribe or backward classes they can also be picked up they should also be given opportunity so what he meant here was that one uh, uh, someone should not be denied of any opportunity to be appointed just because that person belongs to a particular caste right. or uh, community. So that was the basic idea. And if it is included that uh, most of the, uh, uh, you know, people are included to be appointed as, uh, as judges based on their uh, competency and uh, uh, considering that they belong to a particular, particular uh, uh, caste or backward class or maybe a, a scheduled caste, scheduled tribe, if they are also appointed, it will be uh, something which will have absolutely a proper, that point uh, of merit or you know, that point of merit is very important and we'll come to that in a bit but you know in this particular case where does the buck stop because you know the center's argument mostly in in, in when uh, the issue of social diversity is brought up is that you know ultimately it's the names recommended by the collegium that can be taken up yes. by the government but you know if you yes. if you deep dive into this entire issue you also realize that the government is also in a sense uh, accountable at some point because generally it's high court judges that get promoted to supreme court judges or you know uh, you know judges from subordinate courts and local courts that promo get promoted to the high courts and generally we see that at a time when their elevation process you know that that time comes when they can be elevated there's some sort of a frivolous complaint that's filed against them and by the time these complaints get resolved it's too late and they get retired so somehow it has to again the whole debate of the government collegium uh, sort of uh, working in tandem 
also uh, you know is important in this debate as well yes uh, i do agree to some extent see mm. uh, the issue is that everybody should be given opportunity who are competent to be appointed as the judges that is right. the basic idea irrespective of the caste or uh, you know any community or anything so uh, it will be better that uh, most of them are included in the appointment so that uh, everybody gets the opportunity uh, with their co uh, competent uh, competency as i said uh, but as you said that uh, there are certain allegations which are leveled against uh, some of the uh, you know the people who are competent to be appointed as the judges see this is something different i understand that it may take some time and thereafter if they are uh, said to be you know not involved into anything which was made uh, allegations about so hmm. in those kind of cases there can be some uh, rulings or th there can be some amendment in the law or system which can be brought in by which uh, their uh, next uh, you know uh, use when they are eligible to become or to be appointed as the judges that can be taken care of in due course of time so that they don't lose the opportunity uh, which had come on their way earlier uh, but uh, i think uh, the government is uh, thinking in that way so that uh, many of them can be included so that nobody is left out and everybody gets the opportunity you know to be appointed uh, as the judges and judicial system also uh, becomes uh, you know uh, it can cover most of the categories of people so that uh, it is not uh, you know uh, it, it becomes uh, a kind of uh, you know justified Absolutely. way of appointment yes right. so this is what is the and as yes. you were mentioning earlier as well ashutosh you know judges of the supreme court and the high court are appointed under articles 124 217 and uh, 224 of the constitution just for clarity of our viewers yes. that do not provide for reservation of any caste or class even though yes. you know the national commission of scheduled castes has said that you know the 49.5% reservation must be followed in the appointment of judges as well that's something that's been their request that's something that been that's been their demand but you know as an advocate of the supreme court do you think that you know some sort of reservation uh, Uh, when it comes to judges will that benefit us of course that point of merit and competence you talked about is important but you know this do you no. think reservation in this particular scenario is largely going to benefit us no no see there is no question of any reservation here non the even the government is not talking about any reservation yes. for the appointment of any judges yes. see the government is only saying that whoever is competent so the other caste or community or the backward classes they should also be given opportunity that doesn't mean the reserved category it it is it is it is basically targeting and saying that just one person who is belonging to a backward class should not be denied an opportunity to be appointed right. as the judge judge of of the supreme court or the high court fair point so the john dayal john dayal is now also joining us on the broadcast is writer and human rights activist uh, thanks very much sir for joining us on ndtv you know we've been discussing about uh, this very important point of merit and competence and something that i'd like to quote here and something that i think is important as far as this particular debate is concerned that uh, you know the national commission to review the working of constitution headed by retired chief justice of india uh, he said in his report of 2000 that over 50 years of progress in education however tardy has certainly produced adequate number of persons of the sc st and obc communities in every state who possess the required qualification having necessary integrity character and acumen required for judges of supreme court and high court for appointment as judge of the superior judiciary that's an important point mr dayal isn't it because it's not like there's unavailability of candidates there are people there who are very capable but there needs to be some sort of a push that is required as far as this particular debate is concerned to actually ensure adequate re representation because as i said there's no unavailability of candidates you know, there's a very famous cartoon which graphically tells you how do you get equity and equality of opportunity one is to put them at the same ground level and see if they can be hoisted up the other is to put give each one a certain handicap as it is called in golf and many and chess and many other things so that people start at a level playing field the level playing field has consistently been missing not only on the issue of a judiciary but also on many other issues where things come in which are not tangible not measurable even when you were quoting the former chief justice you quoted about education so those are degrees you quoted about experience those can be measured but then you come into 
other areas of, 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 of quality, of moral fiber, of character, of, of whatever else that you want, which are intangibles. And it is there that in the selection process, these people are, are, are denied an opportunity. The same can be said for say in the armored forces for instance well mr dayal you know another yeah. important point is that it's been the case historically that there is uh, this sort of misplaced representation as far as uh, you know people from the minority community is and the backward castes are concerned as far as uh, you know representation in judiciary is Everyone. concerned Absolutely. So what really are the reasons? What really are the reasons as far as this uh, is concerned? Because, you know, it's been the case ever since. In fact, it's very famously, it's also been written that, you know, uh, Brahmins or one nineteenth of the nation's population uh, held 33 of the judgeship. So what are the historical reasons when it comes to, uh, you know, people from the SCST communities not being represented adequately as far as higher judiciary is concerned? It doesn't take rocket science to tell you that it is not that castes have a particular inbuilt intellectual potential category. It yes. is the opportunity they have been given. The process of selection of judges, even say in the British courts, that there was a bhaichara, it was a community, it was a club. And, 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 so, and, and the local landlord, the big shot locally, was automatically the magistrate also. So the, the same tenor, the same tone comes in here. The ruling group, whichever it is, elects and selects its own, and it becomes a very incestuous uh, type of exercise. And you can give it whatever name, you can call it college, you can call it any selection committee. But when this incest comes in, when you're choosing from among your own, right. what was used to be called uncle system, or, or I, I could, there were some bad names, and there were some decent names to define this club, this college from which they were choosing. And largely, whether it was the old ICS or, or, or other systems, they were choosing their own. And this, of course, also as a parliamentary panel continues to exist and, you know, in the sense that it's, it's really failing as far as, you know, representing uh, people from the, uh, you know, historically oppressed communities, are, you know, is concerned. But, you know, my last question to you, Mr. Dayal, would be that how important is it to have uh, you know people from the SCST OBC communities from minority communities in our higher judiciaries, you know because it's said often that you know more inclusive and well represented institutions are often more responsive. So how important is it to have this adequate representation as far as rights of those uh, people who are historically oppressed are concerned? I give in a nutshell, inclusiveness yeah. is of the mind, yeah, of the thought process. As it is in any judiciary system, particularly in India system, the Supreme Court is to that extent that it affects me, the bench in particular, which is deciding my case. It is not all 36 judges. Yes. So you can't have one Dalit judge in every two, two, ju two judge bench or three judge bench. We are not talking of that. But what happens when you are a woman, when you are Dalit, when you are Muslim, when you are Christian, and you are Sikh, over tea time, on social occasions, on conferences, on larger benches, the chief justice and the senior judges get to listen to the voice of the margins, even from among their own brother and sister judges. Yes. It is that moment that the collective conscience of the Supreme Court wakes up to the desires, aspirations and fears of women, of Dalits, of Muslims, of Christians, of Sikhs, of LGBTQ and all those things. If only it was represented by Brahmins and Kaistas. Let me, I'm, 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 the, my, all my friends and several of my relatives are from this caste. So it, I'm not demeaning any of them. What I'm saying is, if just, just them, they will know about festivals and functions and, and rituals of their community. Absolutely. But put a clue on how to greet people on Good Friday or Easter or Muharram, which is today. That's right. And, you know, collective conscience is what uh, you said very adequately, uh, very appropriately. Thanks so much, gentlemen, for joining us on the broadcast today. A very important uh, debate, a very important discussion that really concerns all of us and affects us all.